Good morning, Source family. My name is Brandi Horton and I'm one of the pastors here. It is good to be worshiping with you virtually. I hope that you will have a Bible handy this morning so that when we get to the part of the sermon where we read the scripture that you will be able to join in reading with me. I also hope that you will still take notes on the sermon. It's a good way of staying focused. It's a way of coming back throughout the week to what we talked about on Sunday morning. And it's a tangible reminder that God is still speaking even now. So I am a fully grown adult, but I still call my mom every single day. My mom is my friend and even when I have nothing to say, I just wanna hear her voice. I also know that my mom is probably watching the stream right now, so hi mom. Uh, lately I've been calling and saying, well, what's going on at your house and my mom will almost laugh and say kind of the same thing as yesterday you see there's not a whole lot new happening we've been at this social distancing thing for about six weeks now and everything is beginning to feel a little old i know that for us all of the new has worn off every single toy in our house. Family walks have become routine and so is not sitting in traffic. We do the same juggle of Zoom calls and Facebook Live and internet throttling every single day. Even the new has worn off my husband in this season. He's gotten his first gray hairs, but that's really old news at our house by now. Do you all remember the, the movie Groundhog Day where Bill Murray has to wake up and relive the same day over and over again? It, it gets old. Uh, perhaps you've felt that way in the last few days or weeks where you wake up and it's another day at home, another day in front of your computer, another day of bad news, another day with these same people. It feels old and tired. But if we're honest, everything is really new. Uh, I, the whole world is different than it was just six weeks ago. I have never preached from my dinner table to a camera before. This is new. I have never worn a mask to a grocery store before. This is new. I have never worried about whether or not my mail was safe to touch. This is new. I have never relied so much on computer screens or phone screens to connect to other people or just to do my job. This is new. The longer that we do this, the more it will feel like nothing's new except that everything is. Right in front of our eyes, the whole world is shifting and changing. And as Christians, we need to be prepared to live into that new world. We are in week two of a sermon series simply called A New. And each week we'll be adding a word to the end of that sentence to say, what's new? Last week, Pastor Ken preached a new time. This week, the, the sermon is a new hope. Don't worry, I'll, I'll make a Star Wars reference later. In the coming weeks, we'll preach a new chance, a new age, a new creation. Scripture provides us with all kinds of stories of people literally moving from one way of being into a new way of living. Scripture is full of people navigating change and living into something new. The challenge is that often when we have to live into something new, we have to leave something old behind. Change kind of stirs up this feeling of impermanence within us, this feeling that nothing lasts. First Peter is a letter written to the Gentile Christians in Asia Minor. They were being persecuted, so it's a letter of comfort and encouragement. But throughout the letter, 1 Peter helps its readers to find what does not perish in a world that is perishable and perishing. 
First Peter helps its readers to cling to what lasts, to what does not change, to what is new to them, but will never get old, will never get worn out, and will never get tired. The section that we're going to read this morning is actually a word of praise or blessing back to God for what God has done for the people through the resurrection of Christ. I'm reading from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if for now, for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. This is actually a summary of the Christian faith. Through the resurrection of Christ, we are given a new birth, a new life. We are born into a living hope. I think that sometimes we miss the power of that because we actually don't understand the power of hope. We think that hope and optimism are the same thing, as if Hope is simply looking at the glasses half full or finding the silver lining in something, as if hope can be found by forcing a smile or by pushing ourselves to see the good and ignore the bad or by keeping our chins up. But that's optimism. Hope is much deeper than that. It's much more powerful than that. We can't give ourselves or work ourselves into hope. We can't force it to exist or will it into being. You see, hope is a gift. Verse 3 that we read this morning says that we are born into a living hope. You don't make or choose something that you're born into. Someone else does that for you. And in the, in immediately the next verse, in verse 4, it says, and it's hope and an inheritance. I don't think that hope and the inheritance are supposed to be read as two separate gifts. I think that they're supposed to be read as one and the same. The hope is part of our inheritance as the people of God. Inheritance is actually a really common concept in the Bible. It's mentioned more than 250 times in scripture. Unless we think that inheritance in biblical times is holier than it is in our own times, inheritance has always meant that there is something that was not yours before waiting for you to receive it. Inheritance has always been a gift. Whether you use it or squander it or save it or ignore it, it's a gift. Whether what you inherit has monetary value or it's purely sentimental, it's a gift. Whether what you inherit is tangible or not, it's a gift. Something that was not yours is yours now. I read an article earlier this year in the Christian Century talking about the Holocaust Monument in Boston, Massachusetts. The monument in Boston is six glass towers, and up high there are six million numbers etched there to symbolize the the tattoos put on the six million Jews that were lost during the Holocaust. And at the bottom, there's other etchings, etchings of remembrances about life in the camp that are given by, uh, by survivors. The article was highlighting one particular remembrance by Gerda Weissman Klein. Here's what she said. She said, Ilse, a childhood friend of mine, once found a raspberry in the camp and carried it in her pocket all day to present that night to me on a leaf. Imagine a world in which your entire possession is one raspberry and you give it to your friend. 
When I hear that story, I wonder if Ilse kept the berry in her pocket all day, pondering what she was going to do with it. Or did she know? Did she know the moment that she felt its plump, bumpy surface that she would not keep it, that she would not eat it, that she would not destroy it, but that she would give it away? Could she possibly have known that that would be her legacy, that that would be what Gerda inherited from her, that that would be the thing that she left behind? I don't know the answers to any of those questions. After all, unless it was just a kid, but I do know that by Gerda's remembrances that that was never just a raspberry. It was an extravagant act of generosity, a moment of color and joy in a world that was gray and despairing. It was the gift of hope. First Peter goes on to say that this inheritance is unperishable, undefiled, unfading. Now, I know that raspberries either go bad or get eaten, but this raspberry is literally etched in stone now, telling its story to millions of people every year. You see, hope lasts. It never gets old. We never tire of hearing about it. It always reminds us that color can sprout in the midst of gray, that life will find a way, that things grow even when there are death camps, that there is light in the darkness, and the darkness cannot, will not overcome it. First Peter says that this inheritance is stored for you in heaven. And I think that that sometimes makes us think that we can't get this until we die. But actually, this hope is for the present, too. Because of the resurrection of Christ, because of the promise of heaven, we know what's coming, so we have hope even now. Several years ago, David and I decided to watch the television show Gilmore Girls together. Now, I was a teenage girl in the early 2000s, so I had already seen every single episode of the show, but David was not and had not. So I walked in one night to find him on the couch, guiltily Googling the end of the series and what was going to happen. But you know, once he knew how it ended, we didn't stop watching the show. To be honest, once he knew how it ended, the show actually got more enjoyable. He anticipated budding relationships and looked forward to plot turns. And he began, uh, but more importantly, his anxiety was lower. Once he knew how it ended, he had nothing else to be afraid of. Because of the resurrection, because of the promise of heaven, we know how this ends. And by this, I don't just mean coronavirus. By this, I mean everything. We know how the story ends. And the end of the story is resurrection. It's life. It's good. Hope lasts because until this ends, we still have more to hope for. Hope lasts because until this ends, we still hope for more goodness, more light, more life, more grace, more peace, more justice, more joy, more Jesus. The hope for tomorrow means that we do not need to live in fear in the present. The hope for tomorrow gives us the strength for today. The hope for tomorrow means that we have something to look forward to today. Christian hope always takes a twofold shape. Christian hope is always for the now and also for the not yet. Hope carries us from the now into the not yet. First Peter was most likely a general epistle, meaning that it was a letter that was circulated to a variety of churches in an area that were all experiencing similar things. What we know about the Christians and the churches in this area was that they were all experiencing persecution. Most likely it wasn't an imperial, systemic kind of persecution, but it was persecution and suffering on an individual basis being attacked by family members and friends and neighbors for following Jesus. And in the face of this suffering and trial and attack, 
that's when God offers new life, a living hope, and an inheritance. Even if the kinds of suffering and persecution that you are facing are not persecution for your faith, God still always offers in the face of suffering and distress and anguish new life, a living hope, and an inheritance. Hope and suffering are not mutually exclusive. In fact, hope and suffering are all kinds of mixed up together. Because to know light, we have to see dark. To know healing, we have to know that we're broken. To know hope, we have to be able to see despair. Most often in scripture, joy and hope come out of sorrow and suffering. Hope is not born because life is put together, because life is neat, because life fits into nice little boxes. Hope is given to us because we need it. Because God tells us, God promises us that, there, that life can be better than this. Because we know that the world as it is and the world as it should be will one day be one and the same. Hope is often sown in tears. Star Wars Episode 4 is called A New Hope. Here it is. I promised it to you. Uh, and if you're not a Star Wars fan, Episode 4 is the original Star Wars. It's the one that was released in 1977. And somewhere in my sermon preparation this week, I, I looked at David and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Episode 4 is called A New Hope, but doesn't Darth Vader destroy a planet in that one? And doesn't Obi-Wan Kenobi die? And Darth Vader still lives to fight another day? None of this sounds very good. Tell me, where is the hope? And David, being David, didn't miss a beat and he said it's at the beginning. Leia gives the plans to the Death Star to R2-D2 and the whole premise of the movie is to get a little bit of hope into the right place. Brandy, a little hope, even a little hope in the right place can save the galaxy. I know it's dark. I know it's dark out there. I, I know it feels heavy. COVID-19 is causing a lot of suffering physical suffering, emotional suffering, economic suffering. There's a lot of dark, but even a little bit of light can brighten a whole room. And no matter how dark the dark gets, it does not make the light any fainter. So let me tell you about the light, our light, Jesus. Jesus is, a, is more than a little bit of hope in the right place. Jesus is a lot of hope in the right place. He was born, he lived, he loved, he suffered, he died, and he got up. The man got up. And if you believe him when he says, I'm the resurrection and the life, you can count on getting up too. Don't just believe it, count on it. Hope is counting on it, planning for it, preparing for it. Jesus is a whole lot of hope in the right place for this place, for this time. John 1 says, We have seen his glory as of a father's only son. The word glory there comes from the Greek word doxo. Uh, doxo literally means a glow, like the glow around a candle when a candle's in a dark room. It, it, if you light a candle, it's like the candle is wearing a halo of light. And it's interesting that we actually have an English word that, that means halo of light. It's the word corona. Jesus is the corona we need right now. He's a whole lot of hope in the right place. He is the light shining in the darkness, and the darkness will never, ever overcome it. Have hope, my friends. We know how this ends, and the darkness is not the end of the story. The darkness does not win. Jesus wins, and all Jesus had in the world, he gives freely to you. So accept his hope. Take his hope. It will not disappoint. 
Let's pray. Holy God, we are so tempted to look for hope in other places that are not you. We put our hope in money and booming economies and power and having our way and owning possessions and controlling our environment. And none of these things last. And you know it. We know it, but we keep grasping at straws. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us for not recognizing that you stand ready to be our hope, our portion, our guide, our shield. Lord Jesus, you offer hope that lasts, life that really is life, love that never fails. Help us to accept your offer. Help us to know the light that shines in the darkness. Help us to put our trust in you and you alone. Lord Jesus, in this season where life is so different and can be so heavy, we pray for each other, for our church and those joining us online in our need. We pray for those who are squinting to see your light through tears of fear or of grief or of pain or of sickness. Grant them eyes to see you, that you may comfort them in their need, and grant them hearts open to you that you may transform them by your grace. As you are light and hope, Jesus, make us to be bearers of light and hope to a world that so desperately needs it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Source family, we always end our time together with an invitation and a blessing. The invitation this morning is pretty much the same as it always is. God's word invites you to respond. So this morning, I hope that you will respond in prayer by praying alone in your home or by praying with your family, whoever is with you. And if you are in a place where you are ready to make Jesus the source of your hope, I hope that you will reach out to someone at the church. We would love to journey with you through that. Receive this blessing as you go, Source family. May the God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is the source of resurrection, be the source of your hope this week. May hope surprise you in the midst of despair. May hope uplift you when you have reached your limit. May hope keep you moving forward through your fear into abundant, joyful life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.